Okay, we're continuing in meeting management today with several bits and pieces before we get back to our building blocks and parliamentary notions. Uh, earlier in the semester, you'll recall that uh, we looked at several issues of Convene Magazine, which uh, the Professional Convention Meeting Managers Association has been kind enough to let us use in conjunction with this class. I would just call your attention to a couple of articles that may or may not have relevance to you uh, either now or in the immediate future. One is entitled CD-ROM, Turning This Into a Competitive Advantage. If you are associated with a company that might be interested in creating your own CD-ROM for some reason, uh, there's some good advice in here about what to do and how that can be used and how you go about uh, doing that. But you don't specifically have an assignment in this class to go out and generate a ROM. Uh, we've talked about uh, teleconferencing just briefly. We've mentioned it as one of the ways that groups may uh, conduct national or international meetings. And this same issue also has an article about going online with teleconferencing. And uh, possibly one of the largest regular teleconferences that occurs, uh, occurs with the American Association of Blood Banks and they link up regularly according to uh, this article uh, by Joseph Lennon. They have 140 sites and some 2,000 members at the combination of those sites. And on a regular basis, they link up and discuss everything from transfusion techniques to uh, whatever else is going on. But just a reminder that teleconferencing is also a way that uh, boards may meet, executive committees may meet. You can save all the hassle and time and uh, frustration that's involved in flying in together for a meeting site. But you lose the personal touch and the opportunity to go shopping in some other city or whatever. So, you know, there are pros and cons to all of these things, but I would just call to your attention that uh, we have a couple of uh, interesting articles this particular uh, issue. They have some other things, too, about the Internet that I want to pull out for you in the future, but I will get some visuals together to go with those so you can follow those things. Okay, uh, the first question we're going to address today involves how oral and written communication are different from one another. Okay, we've, we've alluded to the need to do reports and... Uh, you have a, a part of your outside assignment involves generating some reports. Off the top of your head, how would you say, what, what's the big difference between a written and oral report? Uh, Michael and the, well, we've got two Michaels here. We'll get Michael in the back and then come forward. Hopefully this thing is on. Is it on? It sounds like it's on. Okay. Uh, oral communications are more direct and to the point, you have the chance to enhance on your communication, be questioned, or uh, also to uh, clarify and explain. Whereas with a written communication, good English writing skills are essential because you may dilute the message, pollute the message, or totally de, uh, distract the reader from the message that it is you're trying to deliver. So it has to be short, concise, to the point, and it cannot leave out any of the the crucial things that you're trying to communicate, whereas with an oral communication, you can open with a statement. People can ask you to uh, elaborate on it. You have a lot of opportunity to shore up whatever it is might be wrong. A written communication, you have no second chance. Okay. Well, you might get a second chance, but the first one certainly, the first one needs to count right. better. Uh, Michael, did he cover what you were thinking, or do you yeah, want to add? I was going to say that written communication might be a little bit more solid, might have more lasting. Um, oral could get misconstrued. Uh, if you are adept at written communication, you can have a lasting record of what you're trying to get across. Okay, good. Yeah. Now also, I mean, there, there, there can be the other side of that as well. Sometimes uh, uh, written communication loses uh, the intended meaning um, of the message. And uh, if, if you're there in person speaking to somebody, you can make sure that they understand what you're talking about. Okay, good. We've got a quick follow-up. I think that businesses have forever... Um, before the advent of the great fax machine, we used to use the old mimeograph, and so things with business was always done on a face-to-face -face handshake basis. Business is now going back to doing that. Business has become so impersonal with the advent of computers, email, and all these other good variety of systems that now the business travelers 
are increasing twofold because businesses are finding that the face to face communication seals a deal that otherwise a written communication might not be able to seal. Okay, I don't want to bog down in the pros and cons of the two, but, but just kind of focus on what the difference in the nature of that communication is because there will be some people that find the need to um, go beyond fax machines and so forth with personal contact. Others will find teleconferencing or uh, some of these other things that we've just mentioned as being the preferable alternative. But certainly when you have face-to-face -face communication, as we've been saying here, you have the opportunity for feedback, as I just got uh, two questions. You have nonverbal cues, you have the facial expression, you have gestures. Uh, it's much easier to determine if there's sarcasm or innuendo or uh, you know, a wry little smile or something. All those kinds of cues accompany the personal face-to-face -face communication. And so those signals may be very important in helping you determine the authenticity of the message. Uh, the ability to have instant feedback is sometimes very important. Sometimes we're at a kind of midway point when you have something uh, such as telephone communication. You get the vocal expression. You get a little portion of the nonverbal cues. But you don't get the facial expression. So you have more information there uh, non-verbally than you may have in a written form, uh, but not as much as you would have in a face-to-face -face kind of format. Email is another step over on the continuum. It may be, sometimes it's interactive if, if you and a friend go online at the same time and there's almost instantaneous response to messages. Other times the server goes down and it takes two hours for your message to go in what would normally take a matter of seconds. Uh, more conventions are being adopted in something like email so that you know where emphasis is or you start using a combination of punctuation sequences uh, to add emphasis and so forth. But when you have written communication, you have essentially one-way communication. Uh, eventually, someone may answer that letter. But often, you are putting it in written form because you expect it to be preserved. You need a file copy. You need a hard copy for verification's sake. You know, we talked earlier about contracts with hotels and, and other vendors. And you need those contracts in good written form. Now, you may email some of that, but usually the fax machine is a good source for that. But what we're going to be talking, focusing on for the next few minutes involves written communication and how the style of the written communication may be different from, in, in some ways, the style of an oral presentation. Offhand, just in terms of the words, the sentences, what kind of a difference would you expect between someone speaking a message and someone giving you a written message? We've touched on that just a little bit. Um, let me get Maria. Uh, a written message would probably be more formal. Okay, and what will make it more formal? The language used. Okay, and how will that language be different from spoken language? Will you use different words? Uh, will the sentence length be different? You want to get in this? I was going to say that you'd use different words, complete sentences, and um, I don't know. That's okay, generally, you know, in oral speaking, we can, oh, you know, pause, use a phrase, start a sentence and not finish it, and that's okay unless it occurs so often that people get bored. But generally, that's tacky in written communication. If you're writing a personal letter to a friend, okay, Michael. Professional communications in, in the field that I am uh, involved in, if you write a brief, say, to an appellate court, and they get a record up at the appellate court, which is everything that went on in the trial court, 
If you can't write and you can't communicate, by the time you go to oral argument, you've lost your case. You've got to be able to communicate clearly, concisely, with proper punctuation, knowing how to add emphasis to written communication. A lot of people can't do that. Everything looks like a monotone. If you can write properly in written communication, you can communicate that message in what we call the version read rule. If I picked up your brief and it was 25 pages, would I know what your case was about without having to hear the oral okay, argument? Okay, and give me specifics of what you would do to that language to make it readable and to make it good written style. We're, we're starting to allude to these things. There is a uh, form of... I mean, you said clear and concise. Correct. And that's a starter. Your punctuation has to be impeccable because by your punctuation as well, they will know exactly where you're starting to... Uh, Stringline the other sentence of what you want to communicate to. Okay, good punctuation. Highlighting and bolding is essential as well in a written communication. Um, uh, leave out the ands and the ors and all the extra words uh, because all that does is distract from the message. Jefferson once said the most valuable of all talents was never using two words when one will do the trick. You okay, get, we're going to follow up on that in a little while. You get while. to the point quickly, you get in and you get out, and you leave a good lasting impression of what your case is about. By the time oral argument swings around, the justices take the bench, they've read your brief, all you've got to do is close up the gaps, which are their questions, to how your theory worked out. Okay, let's, let's stick to the language comparison That's here. That's what I'm yeah, saying. I if don't if the language is proper and correct, the punctuation is correct, it's bolded and highlighted correct, it, is, it, it tells the story in a, in a, uh, like a locomotive. It, t it picks up slowly, should gradually pick up, and head for the finish line at top speed. It's a good writing skill. It's a good communication. People understand it. They don't have to be personally involved in it. They can just pick it up, read it, and know exactly what you're talking okay, about. Okay, well, I want us to focus some more on what that language should be like or what it should not be like so that it does have momentum, does have force to it, and so forth. Uh, For example, outside of law, you could say... Uh, there's a lot of words that are added to a sentence that are so repetitive, redundant, that if you extract those, and, or, and, and, right. and okay. the, let's the. Hold that thought for a minute and let's work through uh, some of these exercises. Uh, first, let's talk about, and we'll get to some verbosity issues in just a minute. Uh, what are some ways to eliminate sex-biased language? And let me give you some examples and then you tell me what you might uh, do instead to uh, make something like this more readable. This print, I think, is too little to go over there. Uh, there are still, and we've come a long way as a culture, as a society, and so forth, but so this is just kind of a little consciousness raiser today. Uh, what might you say instead of, and these are kind of some job type stereotypes, police woman? You could say police. Okay, police officer is probably the most ge generic instead of policeman or policewoman. Businessman or businessmen. Executive. Okay, executive, maybe manager, supervisor, whatever uh, the appropriate title there is. A CEO depends on <clears throat> what level you're dealing with. Uh, six man committee. Six person committee. Okay, six person committee. Uh, steward or stewardess? Attendant. Okay. Or personal attendant. Okay. Well, yeah, if we're talking about airplanes, flight attendants. The foreman? Or some kind of a jury. Oh, okay. You went to jury. I was on work site. The foreman of the jury is the person elected to. Uh, right. I know who it is. So yeah. now they call them four persons. In law now, they don't call right. them foreman anymore. But, but there are also foremen out on the construction jobs, and that's who I had. Oh, in no. The boss? <laughs> You okay. know, I like it even better when you call him the boss. The boss, okay. Yeah. Well, if not the boss, maybe just the supervisor. The maid. <laughs> the super, yeah. The maid. Maid can be of any gender. I mean, it could be a male maid, it could be a female maid. Could. So you don't have to change that. The maid is a maid is a maid. Oh, uh, well, what do you usually think of when you hear Female dressed in an outfit, cleaning With up. a cute little French apron, right. okay. Is there a generic label Probably for the... Oh, uh, maybe. I've heard, yeah. Domestic engineer. <laughs> Domestic engineer. Okay. Housekeeper might do. Okay. Um, sometimes we get into situations where we use job title qualifiers. 
we talk about the male nurse, the male secretary, the woman lawyer, you know, like this one is an exception to the rule. Uh, is that a good idea, or what should you do, Michael? Okay, normally you don't need that qualifier on there. You just refer to them as lawyer or nurse or whatever and let society get over We're there. We're writing about them to the client, to the client, refer to them as counsel. This way gender there never comes into play. According to counsel's suggestion. Right, but most of the reports that you all are writing in here and that you're going to do as meeting managers, uh, counsel is not going to be an applicable term. So we need to spread this out a little bit and get across more context. Okay, sometimes, and I see this a lot in student papers uh, when I'm grading, so all of you that have papers to turn in, make a note. Uh, you want to avoid getting in a situation where you're using the generic use of pronouns to mean people in general. Uh, when, you, when you have a sentence, when you have things like, each employee should return his forms. Now, how can you work around so, I mean, it's just as bad to say each employee should return her forms. Every employee should return their forms. Okay. Or just employees should return their forms. And that'll save one word. Every is not necessary. Yeah. Right. Little verbosity there. But we got, out, we got to the generic uh, issue. Every employee, I mean, employee should return the form after it's completed. Well, if there's only one form. But if you've got a whole handful, then you need forms, plural, and another adjective. Okay, he who tries will succeed, which may be a lie to start with. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, one who tries will succeed. Any other one? All who try will succeed. May not be true, but the sentence at least fits. Okay, the sample I had here, I just wrote down, those who try will succeed, but that's no better than all necessarily. Okay, but it's, it's a more generic uh, use of the wording. Okay, if a student, this is not necessarily true, but if a student fails, he may retake the test. You've got that same problem of a student, he. And anytime you've got that singular subject with, if you've got a singular subject, you're forcing yourself into choosing a masculine or feminine pronoun. Students who fail to complete the course successfully will be given an opportunity to retake it. Well, okay, we weren't talking, we're just talking about the test, not the course. You turn the whole thought around. Okay, what do you want to say? I said it. Any student, or I was thinking if any student fails, but then I forgot the, the second part of the what, what was said. May retake the test. If any student if any student fails, they may retake the test. Okay, but see that's a mismatched reference. If any student, oh, they this. because <laughs> any, yeah, and I get a lot of those singular subjects with plural pronoun reference. Yeah. If students fail, they may retake the test. Is that okay, that's closer. Students who fail may retake the test. One who fails may retake the test. The main thing is becoming aware of it so that you're watching for singular subjects where you don't necessarily need them. I mean, sometimes you have to have that. It's just the nature of what you're talking about. It could even be turned around to say, if a student fails, he or she may retake the test. If you have to have the singular subject, then you probably need the he or she. Sometimes you even see it written with the S in parentheses, the sh, he, da, da, which is kind of strange, but it's fair. You know. The main thing to get out of this is consciousness raising, recognizing that if you can use a plural subject and there, T-H-E-I-R, there, you're in a more generic writing situation than if you have the singular subject and the he, she issue. And if you can find uh, generic terms like flight attendant or one or individuals who, yeah, there's some ways to work around those things. But for sure, you don't want 
forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> you don't want mismatched reference. You don't want singular pronouns with plural subjects or plural pronoun reference with single subjects. That's probably the tackiest form of this. Mm -hmm. I have a, a relational communications book for another class that uh, some of the text sometimes it'll, it'll be referring to a person and then it'll give, uh, it'll say she, you know, it'll be talking about a teacher or, or a person, not really gender specific, but then it'll say she. Uh, and this happens throughout the text. And I'm, I'm just wondering. Does it have a female author? Uh, actually, I don't know. I yeah, it doesn't. Uh -huh. and I'm, I'm just wondering if that's, it, I guess it's acceptable, but I'm, I'm wondering how often is it acceptable to do that? My preference would be, and particularly when you're in the workplace doing reports and things in, in business settings, that you work for neutrality. You know, that you're saying individuals who may do thus and so, so with their luggage or whatever it may be. There are instances where authors are intentionally reversing the pronouns, trying to get you out of the sex role stereotypes, referring to the housekeepers as he or the doctors and the lawyers as she. And depending on, you know, particularly with textbooks and academic settings, you may find some of that going on. I've found some authors who uh, will shift the pronouns within a chapter. They may use he in one section and shift to she in another section. In some instances, they even put a qualifier in the preface of the book saying that we're going to try to distribute the gender-oriented pronouns on a reasonably equitable basis. Mm -hmm. My question to that would be why? Why, why? why do that when you can just work around it? it? Yeah. yeah, my preference would be for working around it, but it may be done as a consciousness raiser to get you to snap out of uh, that sex role stereotyping. Michael? Okay. Uh, okay, here are some other little tacky things that are either too wordy or uh, a better, better word choice probably uh, would be appropriate. This is still a little bit sex bias, so we'll leave that question uh, over there. Okay, instead of saying co-ed, what might you use? What did you say? Well, oh yeah, you could say unisex, but who are you talking about? Hmm? Co-ed, it, it depends on what you're saying when you say co-ed. If you're talking about co-eds, that's usually talking about female students. If you're talking about a, a co-ed, um, Yeah, I, and, and I had it in my head in reference to female students. Okay, you might just be able to say student. You might need to say female students if the gender issue is important. Now, that one's kind of open-ended. Yeah, but I wasn't talking about co-ed dorms or whatever. Thank you. Okay, Girl Friday. <laughs> Temporary help. Temporary help. What else? I was, I was looking through the classifieds of a, of a trade magazine, and uh, I saw uh, an ad wanted for a, a person Friday. And I was a person Friday. You know. See, that just loses the effect, doesn't it? Okay, so what were they really looking for? Okay, well, what's a shorter form of temporary help, even? Temp. <laughs> That's really short. Okay, uh, the, the word I wrote down, and it might, might, might or might not apply, depending on where you are, is assistant. Temporary help is an assistant. You know, I'm getting thumbs down from this in the back of the room. Okay, think about that. A career woman. A not a feminazi. Thank you very much. <laughs> a professional. Mr. Limbaugh. Hmm. You could refer to them as a, as a professional. Yeah, professional. That's a good choice. There might be some others. Good individual. Okay, that's wordier, but it's safe. Okay, the little woman. <laughs> <laughs> Who are they probably talking about? 
to watch Leave It to Beaver. Yeah. Remember how the Beaver Cleaver had household hands? Mm -hmm. Father knows best. That's right. These are classics. Okay, but we've. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the little woman usually refers to the wife. And if that's what you mean, then put wife. Same you know. thing with old man, though. Yeah, yeah, mean old man. Too. You know, are you talking about the father, the dad, the husband, whatever. And sometimes you need those references. You know, if you want to say the guys are going to be in a business meeting and the men are going to be in a business meeting and wives may go on a sightseeing tour or whatever. But your children know better. When they want something from you, daughters call you daddy. Okay, but we're talking about written communication in professional context. Well, when she sends me a note or she needs something, it's daddy. When is it's that a professional father. communication? For her, it is. It's how deep she's going to get in my pocket. Yeah, well, I'd call that interpersonal. Okay, manpower, referring workforce. to people. Okay, workforce, maybe personnel, depending. Uh, spinster. <laughs> Not a spin stress. Probably just an unmarried person, okay? Uh, That's it. It's, it's an unmarried I'm woman. Married. Unmarried. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, probably. I started to put some stereotypes in here, but I won't. Okay. Uh, okay, let's talk. We were uh, referring a minute ago to punctuation and, and wording in the sentences. I want you to think about conjunctions for just a minute. How conjunctions impact the message and you may not have thought about the difference between coordinate and adverbial conjunctions. You read through these all the time but you may not have known what they're called. See I dust off my English major every once in a while for these special occasions. Okay, coordinate conjunctions are things like and, so, but. Adverbial conjunctions are the ones like therefore, however, nevertheless, moreover. The coordinate conjunctions coordinate two independent thoughts. They, they link two independent clauses together. The adverbial conjunctions link, well, they link independent clauses, but they do it in a different way. You have to have the punctuation with those. So almost, there may be an exception somewhere, but as a general rule, when you have an adverbial conjunction like moreover, nevertheless, you're going to need uh, unless it's just leading the front of a sentence, but if it's connecting two independent thoughts, you're going to have a semicolon, moreover, comma, da 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 da, here goes the rest. Is that making sense? Okay. Uh, do you think one is any more forceful than the other? If, if I you would think that adverbial conjunction would probably be a little bit more forceful if, you're, if that's what you're referring to. It, 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 there's a, a pause or a hesitation after when you're reading it. Hmm. Okay. Might be, and I don't know if we can generalize about this either. Uh, in some ways, the coordinates seemed more forceful to me, but as we're talking about it, I could see it going uh, either way. You might just have situations like, John was upset and so he quit his job. Uh, Mary was upset, semicolon, nevertheless, comma, she kept on working. But I mean, it may depend on the content, too. Mary was upset, moreover, she quit her job later that day. Mary was upset, so she quit her job. I don't know. But think, think about those. They're going to differ in punctuation and know that when you have those independent, when you have what really amounts to two sentences being connected with one another, 
you're likely to need a semicolon, a con uh, an adverb, a comma, and the next sentence. Okay, we won't bog down in that. Uh, but the semicolon is sometimes in there uh, functioning to give you the break between the independent clauses, and that's important in helping to keep the flow of the sentence together and uh, helping the reader know where the thought starts and stops. Okay, here I'm going to give you a few examples now of what's sometimes referred to as dead wood. Get this in focus here. And we'll look for a simpler wording in each of these cases. Uh, sometimes you get sentences that are labeled as being too verbose. Okay, you may have uh, teachers tell you that the, uh, your writing is too wordy or whatever. So what we're looking at here is dead wood in messages. And uh, we'll move these over and then talk about some of these. Okay, what could you say instead of whether or not? I need to know whether or not you're going to go. Okay, you could say if. Okay, probably if. Okay, point in time. When? Yeah. At what point in time will we hold the meeting? When will we hold it? Period of time. Okay, how long is an option? Depends a little on what the context of the of the wording is. But yeah. Okay, at a price of $5. What are you saying, Tracy? Price. Okay, if I said these books may be purchased at a price of $5, how can you? Okay, for $5, or you could say at a cost of $5, but that's still several words. But you could say the cost of the book is five dollars, which it isn't. It's free with your subscription, <laughs> unless we imply something. Okay, uh, you want to eliminate whatever needless words that you have there. So, enclosed herewith, please find. Okay, you could say enclosed, please find. Sometimes you just go down to the bottom and go E and C for enclosures and put a semicolon and put them in. All right. But if you need it up in the text, I have enclosed related documents. Uh, important essentials. Essentials, yeah, I mean if they're essential, aren't they important? Okay, that one's redundant. Uh, same way with basic fundamentals. Okay, if, if they're fundamental, they should be basic. During the year of 1977, in 1970, see, and, and we read this all the time, and if we're not careful, we write this kind of stuff, and you're, we're just wasting space, whether it's email or the laser printer. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking? <laughs> he told me not to say it, so I won't. He told you not to Sometimes. We do it on purpose, knowing that it'll take up more room. That's game. right. And I, <laughs> confessions of a true student out here. We do it on purpose, so it'll take up more space. Uh, it's the same technique that's used in rewriting the question. No. In answering the question of whether or not blah, 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 and here it goes for five sentences, one needs to consider the significant aspects of this question which are related in a number of ways and interface with one another to impact significantly upon the people involved. There have been times grading, <laughs> am I giving you ideas? <laughs> you already have, some of you do. Others out there go, oh, I can use this stuff. <laughs> Don't turn it into me, folks. <laughs> because there have been times when it was so bad that I went through with a pen and I drew lines through all the gobbledygook and then went back through and underlined the part that really said something. 
you know, and then wrote an answer, a note to the side that said, you've answered about 20% of this question, or whatever it may be. So you may be able to pull that off some places. Okay, there are a couple of others here. You're having such fun with these. Seven in number. Seven, okay. Circular in shape. <laughs> Just circular. In the state of Kansas. In Kansas. At a later date. Later, okay. The general consensus of opinion among people. <laughs> yeah, we, we agree on these. In at the hour of 4 o'clock. At 4 o'clock. Okay. Um, we want to focus for a few minutes on how written reports should be organized, uh, what kind of structure you might use in putting those together. We've talked about uh, committee reports uh, kind of in passing so forth. If you're writing a committee report, what do, what do you want in that report? Who's going to write the report? Yeah, I give it a wild shot here. The secretary, maybe? Um, not, okay. not, not the secretary, secretary, but the... Not person. the executive secretary of the organization, is that well, what you're saying? Well, what I'm trying to say is the, uh, the person who is... Maybe like the head of the organization, the chair of the organization, um, or the committee, the chair of the committee? Okay, often it's the chair of the committee. If you have a secretary to the committee, that person might do it. Uh, but many group in, in small committees, it's often the chair of the committee who also takes the notes and keeps track of things and is kind of a blend of the uh, presiding officer and the secretary. So uh, it might be the secretary. We'll, we'll just act like it's the chair for right now so we don't have to keep qualifying the referent all the way through. If the uh, chairperson of the committee is writing this report, and chances are they would, they would create a draft of it and then the committee would look it over. Where is the report probably going if we're in a parliamentary situation? Does a committee just send a report out whenever they feel like it? Or what happens to Okay, it's going to go back to the parent body. If depending on what the committee is a subset of. If this is a committee working for the board of directors, it will go back to the board of directors. If it's the board of directors putting together a report for the parent organization, then it will go back to the whole assembly. Okay, and it's important to know for whom you're writing the report. And, and we're shifting gears a little bit here between written communication that you as a meeting manager might use in you know, contacting clients or whatever, uh, to focusing on reports that are coming out of committees or boards that will then go on somewhere else. Sometimes committee, but sometimes you're in the workplace too. So we've got a lot of overlap here. Uh, it may be a report that you're writing for your supervisor. And many of the principles, in, in terms of writing style, the principles are the same of clear and concise and punctuation and good spelling. I didn't hear anybody say good spelling today. Uh, but we should put a footnote in that those spell checkers don't catch them all. You know, the spell checker can't tell what from hat and when from hen. And some really strange things come through when they haven't been proofread. OK, if the committee is putting together the report, though, probably the chairman's going to our chairwoman, our chairperson, our chair inanimate object, whatever you've got here the head of the committee, is going to draft that report. Um, there's no problem, generally, if the committee all agrees. You know, then, then the situation is one of simply getting the wording right, making sure everyone agrees on that wording. Have you ever been in a situation where you were on a committee and you didn't agree with what the committee as a whole thought? Maybe not. If you were in that situation, what would you do? What could you do? 
Have you ever heard anything come through Congress like that, where there's a report and then there's a counter report? Sometimes you hear of the majority report, and then what might you hear in contrast to that? Nobody watches C-SPAN. <laughs> what? No. Okay, the minority report. Okay, and if you feel very strongly, you know, you're on a committee maybe of nine people, it could be five people, and three of them agree, and those three are the majority, and that's the report that comes out of the committee, uh, sometimes the report will just say, uh, in a split decision of three to two, the such and such committee offers the following recommendations to the assembly. And generally, you would set those recommendations forth early on, and then you might provide the rationale for those. Sometimes you set up the report uh, so that the investigation is reported up here in the preliminary phases, and then down at the, down at the bottom, maybe in bold ink or in underline or in some way to call attention to it. Therefore, the committee recommends, the committee recommends parentheses on a split decision or on a uh, seven to five vote or whatever, the following recommendations, one, two, three, four. But it's good to separate the recommendations from the information if you've gathered statistical data. And it can work either way. It's helpful within a given organization if the committees all use similar protocol. If all the committees either do the report the background first and then put the recommendations at the end, or if they do the recommendations first and then follow that with the rationale. Then if you're going back through old documents looking, or maybe you know the president's had 11 committee reports come in since last month's meeting, and you're looking to see which ones have action items in them that need to go on the agenda, if you know to look on the last page of each report, or on the first page of each report, that's a nice organized facilitating way of dealing with things. And not just for the president. It's helpful for the president and, or, and secretary in putting the agenda together, but it's helpful for the members as well. If you're going through the stack, you know, you've got reports from 31 district chairpersons here at your state convention, and you're trying to find out if there's anybody who wants something done. Because what would happen if you took those 31 interest groups or chairperson reports and, and the president said, you've had the reports distributed to you, is there any objection to accepting these reports? What's the, and everybody goes, you know, all in favor of accepting all the reports, and everybody goes, aye. What have you just done? Is, is there any danger inherent in that? I mean, you got all this stuff off the floor in a hurry. Now you can go to the beach or the mall or whatever. Okay, anytime you accept a report, you can receive it, which means you just take it and you file it. But if you approve it, accept it, or adopt it, all it works out nicely that all those A words work the same. They all mean that, A, you've taken action on it and that you are prepared to implement, that you are voting to implement what's recommended in those reports. So if those reports have in there recommendations for funding certain things, approving certain things, changing membership standards, whatever, you, know, you better read those reports and don't adopt them unless you believe in what they say, you know, unless you're really in favor of that. And it's why as the person making the report, preparing the report, that you should set forth clearly what you're calling for. Because if people have to read through 15 pages of stuff trying to figure out, are, are you asking for us to change the dues structure in the organization? Are you asking for us to realign the geographical districts? You know, there, there could be problem areas that are identified in a report, and that's all there is to it, that the, the committee sees this as a problem 
that the executive committee should address in the next year. Yeah. But the report has two different items, the one which the, the, the group as a whole agrees on and the other in which they don't agree on. Is it possible to leave that which they don't agree on out? Or do you have to throw, throw away the whole report and send the committee back? Uh, are you talking about the assembly as a whole or the committee? Assembly as a whole. Okay, the committee, when the committee report is made, there's an incidental motion that you could use, what would that be, to separate the parts of the report and vote on those recommendations separately. I think you're saying it. Division right, division of the question. Now, if I'm a perceptive presiding officer, I will do that uh, anyway. Here's a little division of the question motion sitting over here. But that's what you would do with that committee report. You would divide it and break it into the different recommendations and vote on those separately. Okay. Now the problem sometimes comes if in the committee, the committee is not unanimous in their position. You know, you've got a split decision in the committee and so the committee's going to turn in uh, what could be referred to as the majority report. But maybe you're on that committee and you feel very strongly that a different course of action is appropriate. And that's the time at which you have the option of writing what's called the, the uh, minority report. And then when you came back to the assembly, instead of using divide the uh, question, that might or might not be appropriate depending on how many things uh, were in there. When the committee makes its report and moves the adoption of that report, which has the status of a main motion, then um, you would, as the maker of the minority report, this amendment below, okay, you would move to amend the report by either striking out part, well, first of all, in your minority report, you would write whatever your opinion is, okay? Whatever your position on the issue is, whether it's on how to raise money or how to increase membership or whatever the issue is. And then you would move to amend the majority report by substituting the minority report for it. And that would be a way of getting your position on the floor. Then the, and this would have the status of a substitute motion, if, you, if you've read in your section on amendments about substitutes. Uh, substitute mo sometimes a substitute motion just rewords the main motion in a better way, in a cleaner, more concise way. Uh, other times the substitute motion puts a whole new uh, solution or idea or proposal, still germane to the issue in there but maybe you're offering an alternate kind of fundraising or whatever. But anyway, in terms of reports, the minority report would be offered as a substitute motion, which would have the effect of striking out the main motion and putting the minority report in its place. And that's the point in the process where you would do that. If you're the chair of the committee and you're making an action report, a report that calls for action, if you're not making an action report, you would just say, um, Madam Chairman, Mr. President, whomever you're talking to, uh, this uh, constitutes the report of the XYZ committee. And the president would say, thank you very much. You, we have received that report and the secretary will please file it. So we've received it, we filed it, it's part of the records. Okay, but if it's a report calling for action then the maker of the committee would say, here is the report of the ABC committee, and we have three recommendations that we're asking for you to endorse today. A, B, C. Uh, Mr. President, I move, on behalf of the committee, I move the adoption of this report. This is a place where a motion does not need a second. Do you know why? Okay. It's because it's coming out of committee and it's being made on behalf of the committee, and there, unless it's a committee of one person. Occasionally you have a committee of one person, and in that case it would need a second. But all the rest of the time, the report 
coming out of a committee doesn't need a second, and you're just wasting time and showing your ignorance of parliamentary procedure, if you take, say, you know, the ABC committee has moved the adoption of the report, is there a second to this motion? Well, it just shows you don't know. You know, it's one of those little points you don't know what you're doing. But it's the job of the committee chair to move the adoption of the report. And so then the presiding officer would say the adoption of the report uh, has been moved and seconded. Is there discussion on this committee report? At, at that point, the minority person would rise and say, I wish to speak against this report. I served on the committee. Uh, I have these reservations about the report as just now presented. I would like to recommend uh, thus and so, and I have distributed, if you've distributed copies, you would say I have distributed on yellow paper, or pink paper, probably a different color. But anyway, anyway, clearly labeled, tell them how they can find it. Uh, you'll find a second report from the ABC committee, uh, boldly labeled in the upper corner, minority report. Okay, and I ask you to direct your attention to that report at this time, and let me give you my reasons why, da 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 da. Okay, and then uh, having called that to their attention, then you, it would be in order to move to either amend the other report, or maybe you're just speaking against it. Maybe you don't have a solution, you know, and in which case you wouldn't have an amendment on the floor, you would simply be speaking against the main motion by presenting a minority report that shows that there's some, maybe the research was flawed in your opinion in the way that report was put together, okay, but you're speaking against that in that situation. Okay, you may then use Either of those two formats we talked about, um, in, you could call it an inductive versus a deductive approach. Sometimes, and if, you, if it were going to be an inductive approach, you would, you would use a, an organizational pattern of setting forth the problem, you know, what's the situation, what's the difficulty, what was the charge to the committee, kind of a what are we doing here type orientation to start with, but particularly identifying the problem. Membership has been dropping off X amount in the last few years, or uh, uh, our CDs have been building at such a wonderful rate that we need to decide what we want to do with this extra money. You know, it may be a pleasant problem or it may be an unpleasant problem. But an inductive approach would call for you to identify the problem, and then if, if it's appropriate, identify whatever findings you have that are relative to that. Maybe you're looking for a way to earn more interest. Maybe you're looking for ways to uh, increase your membership base. Whatever it is, you as a committee were supposed to find out. Okay? And then finally, then you would present your conclusions. <clears throat> and those conclusions might well take the form of recommendations. But you could turn it around and use more of a deductive approach where you start with the conclusions. You start with the recommendations. It's the determination of the XYZ committee that the following three actions need to be implemented by this organization as soon as possible. Number one, number two, number three. Then you go back to the problem because you know, the, the obvious answer is why? Well, here's what the problem is. Here is what we found out when we conducted our investigation. So in one instance, you're setting forth your recommendations and then following that with the rationale. And then in the inductive approach, you're uh, investigating, reporting, and so forth, and uh, then reaching your conclusions. If you have a really long report, it's, whether it's a term paper, which is a kind of report, or if it's a report for the organization, it's often very useful to use center and side headings. And you, you see those in your textbooks. You see them in Robert, which is your, one of your textbooks. 
you know, there are many places where you see those center and side headings. Those can be very useful, or in some instances, they're almost useless. Can you think for a minute what makes the difference? When are those headings useful? When do they talk? When do they say something to you? And when are they just kind of sitting there? Okay, if you have, we'll go to term papers for a minute. If you have a paper and the headings say introduction, body, conclusion, does that tell you very much? No. Okay. It's probably better than nothing because sometimes I flip over and I know other professors do and I do this with journal articles and different things. I flip and you do it with chapter summaries. Okay, which is the conclusion of the chapter. You often flip to the summary in order to get the essence of what this was about. And if the person has written a good conclusion, that can be very helpful. Okay. But if you can use, whether, and you, know, you do center headings and then you do side headings, and you go back to the center and the side, you can get your style guide to check all that out. Uh, if you can use headings that actually say something, that refer to the specific content that will be found in that section, that's going to be much more meaningful than if they just say introduction, body, conclusion. Uh, you know. If Robert just said incidental motions, restoratory motions, well, he doesn't even use that word. He calls them class B motions that bring, again, the subject before the assembly, which is much too wordy. Uh, incidental motions, main motions, uh, privileged motions, and then all those motions were grouped in there. That would be much more ambiguous than breaking them out by amend limit debate, refer to committee, you know, then you can find each one of those. Uh, if you, in a committee report, put findings, well, okay, we know you're in the historical summary section here. You're, you're reporting on results. Um, but that's still very ambiguous. If you were to put Improve, uh, not an improved, an improved form would be if you put cost. Okay, then we know that this part of the findings relates to cost. And maybe under findings you have cost, you have distance, you have uh, convention center option, whatever it is you're talking about. But if you can get some specific labels on there, then that's much more useful. Okay. But if you wanted to improve it even more, then you might have a side heading that says uh, cost factor favors Houston. Membership prefers ocean cruise, whatever it may be. And then you've got more specific language and you've got something uh, that will tell the reader where they are in the document and particularly if you've got a long document, then you know you're going. Well, you imagine Robert's Rules of Order with one third the number of side headings that it has. You know, even as it is now, you you dig around there in a lot, and you have to flip pages. You know, if you're wise, you go to the index and look up what you want and get the page number. But even when you go to the page number, there, in some instances. There's a lot of specific information on that page. But the use of the side headings and italicized words and so forth helps you find what you're looking for in a hurry. And so if you know your way around in that book, you, know, you ought to be able to find how to declare a chair vacant in a matter of a minute or two. 
you ought to be able to find out how many ways you can amend a motion in a minute or two. Okay, let's shift gears now for a minute and uh, talk a little bit more about the restoratory motions. What does a restoratory motion do? It's not incidental. It doesn't pop up on the spur of the moment. It's not privileged. It's not subsidiary. What does it have the status of? Motion. Okay, it has the status of a main motion. How many uh, restoratory motions have we been talking about? Six. Okay, you want to name them? Take from the table, reconsider. Okay. Rescind. Okay. Discharge committee. Okay. Uh, amend a motion previously adopted. Okay. And resolution. Okay. Uh, resolution isn't really classified as restoratory, but it does have the same status. I don't see my resolution block right now. But a resolution, remember, has the whereas clauses and the be it therefore resolve that, and that has the status of a main motion. All of the restoratory motions have the status of a main motion. That, what does that mean then about these motions? Tell me anything you can think of about these motions that's a true statement. What can, what do we got up here? Amend something previously adopted. What can be applied to that? If this is on the floor, somebody says, I move to amend the previous, the, the motion we adopted two weeks ago on resolution number 14 to. What can be applied to that? Yeah, what, okay, if this is on the floor, is there anything you can do with it? Do the same thing you would with the main motion as far as amendments go and, and, and following the same. Okay, uh, right. Any of these subsidiary motions can be applied to that restoratory motion. Okay, you could postpone it indefinitely. You could say, no, I don't think we should amend this. You know, let's kill it and send it to outer space. You could refer it to a committee. Maybe you're not sure today whether or not you should carry through on that amendment. Okay. You could postpone it to a certain time, say we'd rather talk about this next week. I want some time to think about it. Okay. You could limit debate. Any of the subsidiary motions uh, could be applied to that. Okay. Is there anything else that could occur here? Also. Okay. All of our privileged motions, and I won't stack them all the way up, we'll just do them side by side here. But uh, just knowing that these can go on top of there too. All those five privileged motions are also in order. Okay, and those can be stacked right up on top as well. And any combination of these things can be pending. Okay, does it make any difference if we change, if, if we have discharge a committee in here? Is there anything in this stack that does not apply? No. Good answer. No. But can you envision how that would happen? Here's discharge a committee, and maybe somebody's trying to kill the bylaws committee, the, re the membership committee. And they move to discharge it, and somebody says, I move to postpone that indefinitely. You know, because you like that committee. Okay. What else does this motion do, postpone indefinitely? Besides, if you adopt it, it kills it. But why else does, what's the other reason that people sometimes use that motion? When, when this motion is on the floor, postpone indefinitely, what are you talking about? 
what, what is discussion focused on? The uh, proposed motion. Okay, the discussion is focused on the main motion or the resolution or in this case discharge a committee, whatever it's being subsidiary to, whatever it's being applied to. And in, okay, what kind of, if we haven't specified the limits on debate, what are the rules for debate on any main motion? Whether it's a regular main motion or amend something previously adopted, what are the rules for debate? How many times can you talk on that motion? I'm taking a guess here because I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't read them here. Okay, I didn't tell you to read this for today. Um, if there aren't any rules uh, or, or, or any limits to debate, I would assume that you can keep talking as much as you want to on it. Okay, most groups will let you do that until you get tired of talking. But Robert actually says the limit is two times on each motion. Okay, and most groups don't enforce that rule, but just know that it might be enforced. And if somebody wanted to, they could say, point of order, Mr. Jones has already spoken twice on this motion, and he's not entitled to speak again. Okay. Now we colored this one green. Why is it green? I stacked it here, but it's not a restoratory motion. Okay, yeah, for our purposes, we've color-coded green, the incidental motions. And those are the ones that pop up as the situation dictates, and you take care of them. And those points of order, when you hear those, you sure want to take care of those in a hurry so you don't get off track. Okay, did you start to say something else? No, I just recall you did. Uh, point that out earlier in, in a previous class. About yeah, we talked about a long said. time ago. That's why we have to keep backtracking on this because there's so many little tiny bits and pieces that it takes a while before all of that kind of comes together and makes sense. Okay, if you're the presiding officer and we're in debate, we might stay on this thought for just a moment. Uh, if you're limited to two turns per person on the topic, are there any other restrictions according to Robert. Can you talk an hour each time? Can I cut you off after 60 seconds? Maybe we didn't talk about this before. I don't know if we did or not. I'm, I'm just going to take another guess. Was it two minutes? No. No? Okay. Then. But you're close. Okay, it's 10 minutes. I think we talked about, we used an example of when we were talking about limiting debate, that you might want to limit debate to two minutes or three minutes. When people are making speeches on motions and on issues, two or three minutes gets to be pretty long, particularly if you don't want to listen to them. You know, some of my channel surfers probably already gone to sleep out there. You know, some of the students have fast forwarded some of this. Oh, but, you know, but when you don't want to listen, two or three minutes is plenty long and 75 minutes is way too many. Oh. But under Robert, you, you get on each motion the right to talk two times for 10 minutes each. But generally, that's too much time per main motion for if the group has any kind of a lengthy agenda. You know, if you only have one agenda item for the evening and it's whether or not to hire an office manager, then, you know, you may want to extend the limits of debate and let people have as many turns as they want. You know, you want to work until you get the issue resolved. But under Robert, the rule is two times per person, maximum of 10 minutes, and that's on each debatable motion. So to bring us back to the question I started with and sidetracked all of us, that motion to postpone indefinitely reopens the main motion again. So if you've exhausted, you've got two choices for sure. If you have exhausted the right of debate on the main motion, then 
you could either move to modify the limits of debate to extend those, or you could move to postpone indefinitely, which would open the main motion back up to discussion again. Okay. The, the risk that you run, though, in doing that is what? If you favor the main motion and you just want to talk about it some more, what might happen if you move to postpone it indefinitely? Yeah. Be voted on again? Or, or well, they know. might vote for this okay. and postpone it indefinitely, and that would kill it. And, that, and you don't want that to happen. You know, if you're opposed to the motion and you think you've got a, a majority, you, they, this motion isn't used very often. Because if you've got a majority in favor of the main motion, or the restoratory motion, whatever we've got on, whatever has the status of the main motion, uh, if you have a majority favoring that main motion, you just want to close debate, and how do you do that? Which subsidiary motion do you use to close debate? Previous question? Yeah, previous question. I move the previous question. Uh, you want to get on with the vote and just get it adopted. And if you're opposed to the main motion and you have a majority, then you want to go ahead and get on with it. But it's when you're in that situation that you're not quite clear where the majority is. You know, it's real close. It's a 49-51, a 50.2, a 50.8 type split. And you sense that people in the audience are vacillating on the issue. And you're not comfortable going to a vote. Okay. Also, you might be using this or the motion to table, which takes a majority vote. Uh, well, let me ask you, why would you take table or indefinitely instead of previous question? Maybe you don't have enough people. Maybe the, the motion that you're in favor of doesn't have enough people to uh, on your side to, pa or to pass it. And you would table it to, uh, and, until you know, somebody showed up. That yeah. Would break, you know, yeah. Would, uh, you're on the right track okay. here. The idea is you've got a majority, but you don't have two-thirds. So you're not able to close debate and bring the issue to complete closure by voting on the motion because you're not able to, to get the two-thirds required to close the debate. So people keep talking, the opposition keeps talking and talking and talking. Okay, so what you may need to do is just table it until more people from your side show up. Okay, if you're trying to kill it, what can you do? You want to kill the motion. Okay, we're short on time. Think about that one. Or just let me tell you, you might refer it to a committee and get it buried and lost there. You might table it and not bring it back before the assembly again. You may, uh, yeah, and if, you, if you're down the hierarchy, you could postpone indefinitely. So it depends kind of where you are on that chart. Okay, think about those motions to uh, reconsider and whether, uh, not to reconsider, to restoratory motions and whether or not you have any question about how the subsidiary motions apply to those. And we'll get back to some drills next time.